Today we're talking about confidence intervals. But first, let's talk about the big picture. We have a sample. Number of stoplights I've hit over the last 30 days on my way to work. Number of divorced individuals and a sample of 100 people. My productivity and dairy eating scores over the last 30 days. And from these, we have estimates. Average number of stoplights we hit over the course of 30 days. Proportion of divorced people in our sample of 100. Slope intercept correlation coefficient for our productivity dairy relationship. All these estimates are what we call point estimates. But remember, we want to know something about the population. Number of stoplights I'm gonna hit tomorrow or the number of average stoplights I hit forevermore and all of time. Probability of getting divorced or the proportion of all people in the US, for example, who get divorced. My productivity score if I eat 30 grams of dairy or the true value of the correlation coefficient between productivity and dairy if I were to collect a whole lot more data or something. And we know that if we were to keep collecting data, our estimate or our point estimate is going to change. So average number of stoplights I hit over 30 days might have been 3.1, but if I did it again, it might be 4.2. Or in our sample, the number of divorced individuals was 29, but if we did it again, we might have 33. Or my dairy productivity slope was 3.7, but it could have been 5.9. And we recognize that fact that things are going to have variability and we want to account for that. But first, we must make an important distinction between a confidence interval and a prediction interval. A confidence interval tells us the degree of precision or certainty we have in an estimate that we compute. Like a mean or a mean difference or a correlation coefficient or a slope or something like that. While a prediction interval tells us how confident we are in an individual score, like my productivity score tomorrow, or the probability that I will get divorced. <laughs> Confidence intervals are about estimates. Prediction intervals are about particular scores. Confidence intervals get narrower as we collect more data because more data means we have selected a greater proportion of the population. Technical side note, this is actually a false statement. We are not more confident because we have sampled more of the population. Rather, we are more confident because large samples make it more likely that our sample is similar to the population. Or conversely, they make it more likely that our sample is not very dissimilar from the population. But it's so much easier to say the other way, isn't it? So while confidence intervals shrink as we collect more data, prediction intervals do not. Okay, I'm still confused. Hey, chill. It's all right. Got your back. So let's think of two different scenarios. Okay, I like scenarios. Let's say Jill has developed a new couples therapy aimed to prevent divorce. So Jill samples 100 people and randomly assigns them to either the treatment group or the control group. And after a couple years, she figures out what proportion got divorced in each group. And the proportion that got divorced in each group is a point estimate. And Jill wants to know how effective her therapy is. Because if it's effective, she'll be rolling in the dough. Jill is asking a confidence interval like question. I want to know the true proportion of people who get divorced using my therapy. And is that proportion lower among those who receive therapy? Or another way to think about it is you could ask if she were to administer this therapy to all couples who were ever in existence, what proportion of them would divorce? And how does that value compare to all the people who wouldn't receive treatment? Jill wants to know a confidence interval. Or for those Bayesians in the room, a credible interval. I was wondering when I'd get my turn. Now let's talk about Bill. Bill is about to get married to the girl of his dreams. And he worries he's gonna get a divorce, but he thinks maybe his dashing good looks will prevent the departure of his beloved. And he wants to know if there's evidence for that. So Bill samples 100 married men, rates them on their handsomeness, and tracks them over time to see if they get divorced. After that, he builds a statistical model and then estimates the relationship between handsomeness and divorce probability. Using that model, he wants to predict his probability of getting divorced given his level of handsomeness. Ah, oh, shucks, my dashing good looks ain't doing me any good. So Jill wants to know how confident she can be that her estimated proportion of individuals divorced is close to the true value of individuals who get divorced. And Bill just wants to predict the future. Is it so much to ask for Bill to just stay happily ever after? In summary, confidence intervals tell us how confident we are in our estimates. Or our point estimates. Like the true slope between dairy and productivity. Or the true number of people who get divorced in the US. Or the true proportion of people who wouldn't get divorced if they used Jill's therapy. 
or the true average number of stoplights I would hit on the way to work. And again, confidence intervals shrink as the sample size increases, while prediction intervals tells us how confident we are in the prediction of a single score, like my productivity score tomorrow based on my dairy consumption today, probability Bill's gonna get divorced, and the number of stoplights I'm gonna hit tomorrow. Confidence intervals are about statistics. Prediction intervals are about predictions. So given our sample, we wanna know the degree of uncertainty we have about the population, and confidence intervals and prediction intervals give us some information about that. Now, when can you use confidence intervals and prediction intervals? Always. Whenever we compute an estimate, we can compute a confidence interval. Confidence intervals on means. Confidence intervals on mean differences. Confidence intervals on correlation coefficients. Confidence intervals on slopes. Confidence intervals on intercepts. Confidence intervals on Cohen's D. So any estimate we can compute, we can always compute a confidence interval. On the other hand, when we want to predict a specific score, then we use prediction intervals. And just how do we interpret a confidence interval? What I'm about to explain to you is very nuanced and not intuitive. So buckle up. So we often do what we call a 95% confidence interval. So we're 95% confident that the interval contains the true value? Nope. Uh-uh. Oh, okay. Well, what does it mean then? It means if we repeated the study an infinite number of times with the exact same sample size, 95% of the time the interval we compute would contain the true parameter. What? <clears throat> if we were to perform the study an infinite number of times with an identical sample size and compute confidence interval each of those times, 95% of the time those confidence intervals would contain the true value. Isn't that what I said? No. So look at this graphic for a minute. These represent 95 confidence intervals across 20 experiments that somebody could have done. Now in reality, I performed the experiments in the computer and it did it for me. Now I know that the true value is five because I made it so. Notice that one time out of 20 or 5% of the time, it does not contain five on the 16th iteration to be specific. Or across repeated samples, 95% of the time, the interval contains the true value. If we assume the same sample size, sampling procedure, etc., etc. And that right there is a very important distinction. And tons of people misinterpret this all the time. In the media, statistics students everywhere, journal articles, even stats textbook authors misinterpret this. It's borderline criminal, people. So let's think about a possible exam question. Suppose John computes a 95% confidence interval. How do you interpret this? There is a 95% probability this interval contains the true value. Over repeated samples, 95% of the time, the interval will contain the true parameter. Pizza or Ron Swanson? Perhaps for the first time ever, Ron Swanson is not the answer. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is it that when I say there's a 95% chance it contains the true interval, it's not the same as saying over repeated samples, 95% of the time it contains a true parameter. You know, that's a very, very good question. And unfortunately, the answer is kind of technical and nuanced and difficult. But if you're interested, see the link in the description. And next time, I'm gonna show you how to compute them and how to interpret them with real data. So with that, let's talk about our learning objective. Number one, know the difference between a point estimate and a confidence interval. A point estimate is our best guess of the value that we're trying to estimate, whereas a confidence interval tells you our degree of uncertainty about that value. Number two, know what a confidence interval tells you. It tells you that if you were to repeat this experiment an infinite number of times using the same sample size, the same procedure, 95% of the time the interval you compute will contain the true value. Oh. Oh. Number three, know what a prediction interval tells you. It tells you our degree of uncertainty about an individual's predicted score. And as a side note, the prediction interval is similar to the confidence interval and in its interpretation. If we were to generate predictions for this person over and over again on repeated experiments, 95% of the time, their true score would fall within that interval. Number four, know what a confidence interval can be used for. Hint, we can use a confidence interval for all statistics we estimate. Number five, know the correct interpretation of a confidence interval. Y'all aren't gonna make me say it again, are ya? Hey, I'm paying you to teach me. If we repeated the experiment the exact same conditions, the exact same sample size over an infinite number of times, 95% of the time, the interval that we compute would actually contain the true value. Oh, why can't we all be Bayesians? And to know what Bayesian statistics is about, look in the description. It's a whole lot more intuitive. So with that, I'll see you next time.